What I want to talk about today is my mother. <laughs> I learned this from my mother. Always play to win. Never play not to lose. My mother's 97 years old. She lives in Miami in a nice, in a nice home. She worked her way there uh, through the work that my father and, her, and she did over the years. I was born and raised in Cuba, and my parents were married in, their 19, in the 1940s. My father was an accountant, rest in peace, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Today, the fruits of their labor after emigrating to the United States is a, that they have achieved a very comfortable retirement in, in Miami. Specifically, my mother now lives in, in Coral Gables. So. As they grew up in Cuba, my father, as I said, was an accountant, and um, he was more of the conservative type as you would want an accountant to be. My mother, though, was the go-getter. She was the visionary. She was the person that was always putting things out there. And they, to, collectively, the two of them, with her vision and his, and his process, were able to have created a very nice uh, home and, and lifestyle in Havana in the 1950s. But I remember, even as a child, uh, when I was about 10 years old, in Havana, my mother was getting the documents necessary for me to emigrate to the United States. And I remember her standing in line and really, really advocating for herself and what she wanted so that I could have the paperwork. I was 12 years old when I came so that, so that they could send me to the United States. Now, she always played to win, but I want to remind you of some situations that are perhaps more palpable to you, which include, for example, sports teams. I remember distinctly the American Women's Soccer League during the World Cup match in 2011, the American women were, f were fighting for that first place. They were playing Japan for the World Championship, and they did a tremendous job of getting ahead two to one on Japan. But you know, I noticed that they stopped playing to win and they started playing not to lose. They were playing the clock and they were trying to figure out a way that they could hold on to that two to one lead. Well, guess what happened? Japan tied them, so now it's two to two, and they went into a, a playoff, uh, into a Penalty kicks in Japan won. The moral of that story is, play to win. Don't play not to lose. Don't play to keep your, your, your lead, a scant lead as it was, especially in soccer. So that's, that's one of the, the examples that you can see, and sometimes you can see that in, in, sports, uh, in sports illustrations. So as, as I was saying, my mother likes to, to play to win, and so I gained that, and I'm a sports car racer, and what we teach our students, I'm an instructor too, a track instructor, is to keep your rhythm, create a rhythm. When you're out on the track and you're driving your sports car at 140 miles an hour, you have to maintain a rhythm. Brake to gas, left to right, you know, you have to, you have to maintain that rhythm around, around the track so that, you can, so that you can optimize your time from, uh, from the beginning to, to the end. If, on the other hand, and I've seen this, you know, a, a guy's leading the race, he's got a half a lap lead on the, on the second place guy, and boom, he hits the wall. What happened? He was slacking off a bit. He got out of the gas. He didn't break so hard. He broke his rhythm. He started playing not to lose, and then he did. Look at, other, look at a, a couple of illustrations from companies. Blockbuster, remember Blockbuster? They, were, they had a lead. There was nobody around that could beat Blockbuster until what? Netflix. So their business model became obsolete overnight. It's called technical uh, disruption. It's called a, 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 uh, an, a disruption in the technology that caused them to lose their business model. Look where we're sitting in the middle of uh, Kodak Hall. What happened there? They had a huge lead. Kodak had a huge lead, 90% of their market. Imagine having a business with 90% of its market. So it's a cash cow, as they call it in business. And what happened? That even though Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975, they failed to take advantage of it. Why? Because they had a lead that they wanted to preserve, which was the cash cow of chemical film. So they failed to develop a business model surrounding the digital camera, which other people did, and then all of that evaporated. There are many corporate examples. Here's another one. I'd like to follow the, the, the business model of Intel. Intel are the chips that are in your computer. Andy Grove said, only the paranoid survive. So you gotta have that, you gotta have that mental set. If, you got, if you're leading the, the race, you, you, you have to keep pretend, you, you have to, to drive hard to maintain that lead. You don't slack off and break your rhythm, and then the number two guy catches you, or worse, you smack the wall. 
my parents were able to put together a lifestyle in the United States in a place called Dover, Delaware, and they bought their first home. And then one day, I, they, were, they were doing very nicely with their first home. That's actually a picture of their first home, 248 Gunning Bedford. And my, one day, my father comes home from work. He says, you know, they're building a really nice development down the street about three miles away, and they have central air and one-car garage, and maybe we should sell this house and buy that one. My mother says, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> Why don't we keep this house and figure out a way to buy that one, and then we have two. My father says, well, how are we going to do that? You know, I mean, remember, he's the accountant. She says, well, you're the accountant. Go figure it out. <laughs> but he did. He, they were resourceful. They were frugal. They put some ideas together. Again, my mom, the driver, the promoter, and my dad being cautious and watching the, the, the dollars. And they put together a plan so that they could do that. They did it once. So once you do it the first time, it's easier. The second, the third, the fourth. They built a beautiful nest egg of income properties. Okay? Now, this is a man who's an accountant who basically has a desk job. He's a, he's a clerical accountant. So what we get from, from this story, and, and there's more to it, is that it pays to be a visionary. It also pays to be a good team, you know, having a good team of my father being the process guy, so to speak, and my mother being the visionary. Okay? So now they're living in, in, uh, my, they were living in Miami, and they did it with a vision. So let's talk about another example of a vision. When I'm driving a race car, or I'm teaching someone to drive a race car, we have a saying in racing, which is, don't look at the wall. If you look at the wall, you hit it. So don't look at the wall. So when I'm driving a race car, I'm looking way ahead, way ahead. And I have to teach my drivers, you know, you can't be looking at the guy in front of you at 140 miles an hour. You've got to look hundreds of yards ahead so you can anticipate what the cars in front of you are going to do before they actually do it. Okay? That's called ocular driving, where you set your eyesight, your hands will follow. When you go home tonight in your, on, on the road, uh, use ocular driving. It's safer than looking at the car in front of you, so, especially at high speeds. So my mother was able to put together this, this vision that says, you know, of ocular driving in your life. But wait, there's more. There's a concept which is actually studied by the Harvard Business Review, which is there's some people who are like my mother, you know, kind of visionaries, and they, they look at the, the things ahead, and they, you know, in a practical sense, and they can make it happen. Other people, those are called promoters. Other people are more preventive. You know, they, they're, they're hanging on to what they have. They frankly don't want to lose what they've gained, okay? And sometimes it's good to do that, but you've got to mix it up with a little bit of vision, which is what my mother did. So I want you to go home today with a toolkit. One, every time I do a presentation, I want folks to go home with a toolkit. The toolkit has five parts. Number one, set some goals. Set some goals for this year. 2015 is the beginning. You've got 12 months in front of you. For three years out and five years out, set those goals up. And then you can make them smart goals if you want. Look, and look, look that up. Google the concept of smart goals. But set some goals. Number two, don't make those goals too easy. Okay, here's Jen Soar winning a gold medal in the Olympics on the pole vault. She's from Hilton, New York. So make those goals really hard. Don't make them impossible, but make them so that you have to reach outside your comfort zone. Okay, number three, write them down. You see, as it says there, it's a dream until you write it down and it's a goal. So it's imperative that you write down your goals. If you talk to people who are successful in their life, they will tell you that they wrote their goals down. So you have to write those goals down. It also enables you to share them with your family and friends. So uh, you have to start measuring what you're doing. So if you wanted to make more money, you have to measure the money you have now. You have to measure how you're going to make more money. And you have to, take, take, you have to measure the, those things that you want to accomplish. Share those goals with your family and friends. Have a family reunion. Discuss those goals. Share them with your friends, your significant others, the people who are, that you entrust in your life. Okay? It's important. So those, those five parts are very important. Okay? So having goals and sharing them is important. Now let's go back to my mother for a, moment, for a moment. I told you that they lived in Coral Gables. Very nice home. Here's what happened. My father, at the end of his retirement, he goes to Miami and he wants to buy this house. And the gentleman, the real estate agent says, so Mr. Martinez, what are you going to do um, uh, to buy this house? And my father says, I'm going to write you a check. And he says, okay, well, that's very good. You know, that'll be the down payment. Have you secured a mortgage? And he says, no, I'm going to write you a check for the house. You see? So as you leave here tonight, think about this in the balance of the year. Are you staring at the wall that's in front of you? Or are you going to play to win? Thank you very much. <laughs>